so the finale uh, of of our conversations today is um, is here. Um, I think this is a magical domain of visualizing the possibilities of what design learning can be. Uh, of how how do we foster? How do we create? Nurture this ability to imagine, this ability to try and understand the unknown. Given the fact that we've already heard in, in several uh, conversations uh, um, in, in the sessions so far, um, we know that our mind spaces have become very impatient, we are becoming very impulsive. Um, as people, as customers, as consumers, um, as users, and uh, as a race, generally. So, you know, um, so relationships have changed. They've become more fragile and brittle. Um, we don't hear sort of the spoken of lasting bonds with objects, products, services. Uh, we, we kind of sort of um, navigating between different, uh, uh, more convenient things to have and to use. Um, our responses have also become uh, very difficult, right? And if, if we are not, we're very instinctive right now in, in, in the way that we, we, we get we things to happen to us. Um, and, you know, in this world of transition, there is this, the whole, the set of ideas of tolerance and loyalty are also sort of shaky. Right? Um, while this world is changing, human beings are changing, we have an interesting opportunity. Even in this context, yeah, in these emerging realities, how do we see uh, us learning? What is going to be the way of learning? How do we learn to work with things that matter? Um, how do we deal with matter, matters that matter? And so on. And uh, to speak and elaborate about uh, and build arguments about all of this, um, that we can take forward. It is my absolute privilege uh, to invite uh, Don Norden and Carol Redenberg. Um, they are preeminent design thinkers. They are probably ambassadors of, of, of the new design culture that we are seeing evolving today. And uh, their luminaries in their own right. Uh, hi, Don. Wonderful to have you. Welcome. Thank you. I hope it's not very early in the morning. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, starting off the session, um, first question up for you. You you started this entire um, future of design education initiative, which which is absolutely amazing. It's it's time uh, should have come a long time ago. Uh, but anyway, now that the future is here, what inspired us to sort of start this this way of thinking to be able to sort of address this as, as your first time? Well, a number of us have long thought that design, the way it is taught, is inappropriate for the real needs of designers today in the 21st century. And this is true across the world. Design, after all, came out of the Industrial Revolution and was a tool of industry. And it was mainly a crafts, craft skill and we did consumer products and uh, the traditional design schools taught wonderful skills and people make beautiful, wonderful products. And that's good. I like to have beautiful products, but that's not what design is capable of. Design is a, is a way of approaching a problem that can solve and address some of the major societal issues of the world. And uh, we have those issues all over the world. I was in Bangalore and I visited from very, very poor people uh, in the streets to, um, to some of the really great hospitals in Bangalore uh, and also to uh, government health clinics, which are very, very small with very few facilities. And there's a real need to improve healthcare. But when I look at San Diego in California, I see very much the same problems. The same problems exist all over the world and designers, have something that's special that other professions do not have. Because in every time we see a problem, there are experts who are working on the problem. But mostly, 
Well, here's a, here's a problem. In this world, we live in a monoculture. That is, it doesn't matter whether you are in India or whether you are in South America or in Africa or Europe or the United States. Most of the design schools are the same. The professors are the same because they're all taught in the same places. And that we have eradicated the, the power of people. We've eradicated uh, differences among nations. We've eradicated the indigenous groups who have lived in the nation for a long time. And that's a great loss. So we all think the same and we all approach things the same. And it first, first of all, it's a craft, but second of all, it's an arrogant craft when we send our designers and our design researchers to understand the problem, they come back, we do all sorts of thinking and prototypes, and then we deliver the solution. And they're almost always wrong because yes, they are expert and yes, they are, they are approaching the solution, but they do not understand the people. They don't understand the community and the resources. And we have to change. And so that was the impetus that, uh, the problems today are, are much more complex and the old methods are wrong. So uh, that is the beginning of the long journey that we are taking. Carl? I would also, yeah, I would add that it's like at, at, at least two levels. So, so when you think about it from the, from the commercial uh, product development uh, sort of angle, uh, we at IBM, you know, started a whole new program to uh, basically develop a, a sustainable culture of design and des uh, design thinking at IBM some eight years ago, uh, hired some 2,500 designers. And while we we're doing that, we got a really good sense. Talk about a decent sample size, right? 2,500 <laughs> designers. So we basically had a number of, of, of designers from every design school. And one of the things that we found is even for de uh, product development, I, I, and the next level up from that is what Don is describing, about, about sort of designing for the world and designing uh, uh, major uh, changes to uh, sort of world systems and challenges. Um, but even from a product development point of view, we were finding that the pure craft designer uh, was just not uh, uh, cutting it in terms of our, our, our the skill set we needed for for our product development. So we actually created a a boot camp, a three month um, educational experience for every designer that we hired. They, they flew to Austin, Texas for three months. Uh, and in the press, I was, I was quoted as calling that the missing semester of design school. And uh, that, uh, the quote was, was an overstatement uh, in, in the British press about saying that, uh, that the UK design schools were not developing uh, uh, good enough uh, designers, not enough for them or something. It was an over, it, it wasn't an accurate quote, but it got me into a lot of conversations with a lot of design schools saying, what's missing, right? So we got talking about that. So, so there are, there's a level of design uh, that needs to be leveled up from craft where you're, you know, if you're going to design a product, you want to design it so that you're not going to, you know, negatively impact your, uh, your users. You may well be increasing the revenue of your product, but if you're making the product too addictive, for example, or you're destroying the environment with it and the like, then you're not doing the right thing as a designer. So even at product, uh, product design level, I think there's a number of sort of opening the aperture sort of perspectives that we need to provide here as well. And then as, as Don says, the next level up from that is actually, you know, designing organizations, designing societies. And we like to think, I, I think the, the design transformation that we did at IBM, I see as a design problem that we went through. We actually looked at the whole company and said, how, how can we transform 350,000 people to think differently and work differently? And, and in many respects, I think that was successful if we took a, a design perspective, but we don't tend generally teach how to do that. Actually, one more comment, one more comment. Yes, yes, absolutely. I see my friend Surya, I see him, a picture of him, but I also see that he made a comment in the chat saying that an article by the World Design Organization uh, would be, could be of interest. And yes, that is actually a very valuable article. And so one of the sponsors of our effort is the World Design Organization. And one of the members of our steering committee is the president of that organization, and you may know him, Shwini Shwinivasi. Uh, just to follow up on, 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 the, on what Carol raised, uh, what was there, I'm tempted to ask, what was there in that missing semester you talked about? 
Oh, it was, it was largely things like working with multiple disciplines. So designers and business people and engineers come out of, you know, their education, um, knowing only the language of, and, and also, you know, the, 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 uh, the biases of a particular discipline. So if we didn't do that work, designers would come in thinking that they were the center of the universe and that engineers should just develop what they designed and, and business people should just sell what they, they designed, right? And uh, business people come in saying that, well, you know, they're the center of the universe. They're the ones that make the money and all, you know, all that. Uh, and designers that they're just there to make it look pretty. And then engineers, you know, they think they're the center of the universe because they're actually creating this stuff. Well, they're all kind of right, but they all have to be working more closely together so part of it is is to disabuse people of their biases basically uh, about each other's discipline and actually to see and, and start to experience what the benefits are of actually working directly with those uh, disciplines as well that was one you know big one the other big one was working on real hard problems uh, and that uh, in our experience a lot of the design schools were teaching uh, um, with with made up examples that often the students could could come up with themselves and they would then work on that as a problem. Well, that's not typically very realistic of the kind of big problems. And when we would hire them, be like, oh my God, we've never, wow, how do you solve that? Well, you know, get that even introduced in, in the actual educational experience. I think that's a very valid point and I'm going to uh, jump in here for a moment. Um, you know, Don and Carl, uh, and this is really to, to Don, uh, in 2015, early 2015, uh, when we were, and Anando remembers this, a very nascent design school, and we were being pushed towards being a highly siloed design school. Uh, you know, when you did product design, you were in furniture. When you did fashion, you were, you know, on your uh, sewing machines. Um, you know, Don, what was your inspiration to come out with the paper that design education must change? And I think you had a very a strong statement saying that, you know, design education needs to embrace all curricula of the university, whether it's art, science, humanities. Um, and we have a huge number of students who are attending today. And of course, all of them are, uh, I would say, purists when it comes to, you know, I need to draw well, I need to design well, I need to prototype well. Um, you know, what would be your message for them uh, you know, given what you have seen, the transformation of both industry as well as education. Well, we have a, <clears throat> when we talk about design thinking, we say design thinking is wonderful and fun and exciting and useless. And when we talk about the designers, your design may be marvelous and it can even win prizes and it's useless. Why is it useless? Because ideas are actually the easy part. The idea is useless unless you actually do something with it, unless you actually make it happen. And designers aren't the people to make it happen. So we need to have the other disciplines. Just as Carl was talking, we need the business people. We need the engineers. We need the economists. We need materials experts. We need supply chain experts. We need salespeople. We need service people. And what this really surprises people when I tell them, we need politicians. Because many of these very serious issues are issues that have faced the nation. And that, that or, or maybe your state. And, um, but those are big issues, they cost money. And almost anything that's big and important will help a lot of people, but also maybe harm a lot of people. And it may cost a lot of money. And the question when there's a lot of money involved is, well, yes, I can see why what you're doing is valuable, but look, we have these other five also valuable pro projects and we can't do them all. And so that's what good politics is about. Politics is not a bad word. Politics is when there are different points of view and oftentimes these, are, these points of view contradict each other, but each one is correct from the point of the person or the group that is advocating it. And so we have to, so actually a good design technique is called um, empathy, understanding the people you're working with. Well, a good politician has to have empathy for the other points of view in order to reach an effective way of working with everybody. Now, the designers not only must know about all this because they must work with them, but a designer should not simply do the design and then pass it on. Because then designers, designers complain to me Oh, the marketing group 
ruined my design or, oh, the political process wouldn't let it go or they changed it or, well, that meant that your design wasn't completely right. You have to take these into consideration. And so what you have to do is you have to stay with it while the design is being built and done so that if suddenly a new problem comes up or maybe the requirements change, you are right there and you can help make the change. And so it's the, the design for these major issues requires a very different way of working. But let me also point out that even design of, if I wanna design a new stove, a new way of cooking food, uh, a traditional product that, that, that is designers are well-equipped to do, the same issues arise. Unless you work with everybody, the, all the teams in the company, you will not be successful. And that's, that's a new point of view that designers simply do not understand. In fact, most designers say that the company is evil and that the administrators, the executives of the company are stupid. Well, you want to become an executive of the company and you would realize that it's, you're not, it, these are difficult problems. And we need more designers who are running their companies. I wanted to build on that, Don. I think that the, I, I've got a new role at IBM responsible for the design leadership uh, across the company. And we have some 150 uh, sort of senior uh, design leaders and executives. And one of the things I've been pushing is exactly what you're saying, Don, in terms of saying, do, do they stay in their, in their lane as a designer all the, way, all the way up? No, they need to go take on other you know, roles as well. It, it, when you look at the, uh, the effect that, that a designer can have in other disciplines that are um, very different. When you think of like engin engineering, if you can make gen engineering more empathic, the, the, the point uh, Don was making, or, or business for that matter, uh, you make a huge difference. And I, I would also suggest, we, we talked earlier, uh, Don was talking about uh, design and design thinking being useless if, unless it's really uh, effectively done. And I think the design thinking aspect of it, I keep on thinking is just the a designer's way of thinking, right? And that many people can benefit from doing that. In fact, I think everybody should have that. And I think that should be taught actually in elementary school to, to get that designer's thinking, right? But you're still gonna, still gonna have the need for designers that can do sort of the end of the end. But if you only expect designers to do the work, that's a heavy, a lot of heavy lifting to, uh, that they need to do all by themselves. If everybody else has this perspective uh, that a designer has in their roles, whatever they do, you can be way more successful. Um, so, 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 so as a, as a, as a follow-up to that, uh, Carl and Don, uh, you know, there is this, of course, this whole notion of having uh, design education as as a, being a part of, of secondary school education or primary school education. In some way, design thinking, design uh, imparting of design values or principles or whatever it is. Uh, do you see in, in, in times to come that if we sort of um, topple that around and say that secondary school is about, about a design school. It's a design school that teaches physics. It's a design school that teaches botany. It's a design school that teaches uh, geology and geography and all of that. Do you see that as a, as a design framework that teaches everything else? Uh, we think design is too important to do that. And the way that we're doing this is that, in fact, at, in San Diego, we have a number of schools, primary and secondary, that are based around design. But they teach, they teach traditional topics and design is, is simply part of the structure. So we don't teach design. We teach uh, the, in, in the environment or we teach about the, the, the water cycle. Right. Uh, and in there though, we put in the design principles and we say, you know, we are, we are facing a drought. We don't have enough water in, 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 Cal in San Diego. Uh, we actually are surrounded by desert. And um, so how can we solve this problem? And, and what happens is people always say that how well we should not use the faucet so much, we should take shorter showers. And then we say, well, we're, let's think about the design problem. Uh, how much water is used in San Diego? Or how much water is used in California? A large amount. Where does most of it go? Well, most of it is used in agriculture. And how much of the water in agriculture actually gets to the plant? 
oh, maybe 25%. The rest is lost in evaporation and in the transport. And so, yes, you can make, you can take more efficient showers, but will that make a difference? So the point is we're now teaching them system thinking, which is a very important part of design. And then when we look for design solutions, we look for solutions, but we use design principles. Now, uh, we also, when, we, when Carl and I and the 600 people that we're working with uh, are trying to devise a curriculum for designers, we said the same thing about some of the topics. So let's take a topic like ethics, which is very important. Uh, we don't want to have a course on ethics because ethics is too important to have a single course. It should be that all professors and teaching bring in ethical concerns in all of the work they do. Now that brings a rise to one more problem. We're going to make lots of recommendations about wonderful courses that will change the shape of design for the good. The students are ready, but we don't think the professors are ready. So how do we train the professors and get them ready to, to change the way they are thinking? Uh, Siddhartha, you said the same problem happened when you tried to change the curriculum. The professors rebelled. And actually, you said, you're not a designer. And I say, good, because we need people who are not designers, who look at, it, who look at design somewhat differently. I was not trained as a designer. Carl was not trained as a designer. Some of the best um, <laughs> designers in the world were not trained in design. We need people with all types of training. I would add one other thought to that, Don, that actually using the, the design sort of philosophy and, and skill set to actually design the education as well. So uh, I know there's a, when we were talking about, about sort of elementary school education, I know that we're working with a number of, of school boards a, a, around the world, and I think several in India as well through, through my contacts there. And actually having, you know, when you're talking, Don, about, about uh, faculty not necessarily buying into it, it's actually using uh, design methods to actually design the curriculum. is actually a, a, an amazing way to do it. But a lot of people are like, whoa, I just teach design. I don't, I don't actually use it to, to, to design what I'm actually trying to, uh, the experience and the learning I'm trying to actually imbue in, our, in my students, right? So I think that's another whole way of thinking. It's, it's, a, it's a little circular, but it's, it's, it's really, I think, the way that we need, we need to be thinking about designed education as well. As a follow-up to that, since you, since, you, since you brought that up, Carl. Uh, so can you now, in, going forward, do you, do you think in, in these times, can you teach design? Can you, or is, is, is I mean, I sense it differently, but what, what's it, what are your thoughts? Can you teach design at all? Or do you yeah. know the way? How do you, you do can, it? But, uh, just a comment. Uh, in, in, in my school, we have said, we are not going to talk about teaching. We're going to talk about learning. Mm -hmm. Teaching implies that a professor stands up and tells the students the truth. And we say, no, that's not how people learn. People learn by struggling, by doing, by making. And one of the best ways of learning is to do it wrong. And so what we have to do, I'm trying to teach my teachers <laughs> to make mistakes in class, to do something wrong in class, not to think about the problem beforehand. And if a student asks for an answer, you say, oh, let me see, we'll go this way. Oh no, that's not working. The student will learn that if you do it wrong, yeah, everybody does it wrong. The world's experts do things wrong, but it's not important. We notice it, we correct it, we step back, we say, so let me think about this again, because that's what real design is about. And that's how you learn, by the way. You learn when you've done it wrong, but, but you consider that not a problem. Let me understand why I did it wrong. Maybe I didn't understand something. Oh, I, now I can ask my teacher. I'm, I'm confused here. Can you help me on this? The other, the other way to think of that as well is that when we created those boot camps, like we did the three month ones, and then we did one week for existing employees, right? And we took it again as a, as a design problem and it's entirely experiential learning, right? So it's like, you think about it from the point of view, we mapped uh, the week of education and said, what, what emotional state do we think that people are gonna be in? So we purposely wanted to start people really annoyed 
like really, really annoyed. Because a lot of these people are engineers and business people, right? Uh, so we had them fly in on a Sunday night. You know, who, fl who wants to fly in on a Sunday night, right? Start eight o'clock in the morning, you know? And, and then we asked them, you know, uh, one of these, you know, hopes and fears, what, what, what will, what will, what's your view on what won't work uh, about what we're about to do? And everybody's like madly writing all this stuff. Yeah, that'll never work. We tried it five years ago, all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then we figure by, by mid, I mean, we did a really long first day. And then by Wednesday, we figured we were, uh, people were going to start to, to, to turn. And, and, and we would get that people all of a sudden saying, you know what, these methods are making me, I've been working on a product for 15 years. I've now got this entirely different perspective on the problem I'm trying to solve in a 15 minute exercise that you've made me rethink, you know, the problem that I'm dealing with. And then by the Friday, we would go back again after they'd had all the, these experiences and, and say, now let's revisit all those things that you said that were going to be problematic. And almost all of them with a few things like what does the CEO say or whatever, we don't have complete control over that. But there were a few things uh, that uh, that were left, but almost everything else was addressed, right? But but how was it addressed? As Don says, not in the, we now taught them the stuff they needed. We do very little teaching. It's like all of like 90% of everything they do is actually just experiencing it and running into problems and then having to resolve those problems. And one of the things that the, the, the students for, for the introductory sort of uh, boot camp were saying to us that you know, in school, we used to do you know assignments, you know, uh, one assignment every week or two weeks or whatever. You're giving us assignments every two hours. You know, you're having to do presentations and what we call playbacks. And they're saying, yeah, but we want you to, to, to experience and get feedback and do critiques on a regular basis and then shape what it is that you're doing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's learning and not teaching. No, I'm gonna pick up one or two questions from the, the crowd if I'm, I'm allowed to do that. So this right. question is from uh, Kanika. It's a slightly different topic, but um, it's, um, she's asking, you know, uh, how do you include um, users at the designing stage? Uh, and if you can shed light on participatory design, because in industry, professionals tend to overlook it because of the time constraints and the unavailability of users. So a slightly different track, but uh, would love to get your insights on, on, on that. Yeah, my, well, my sense is that you can't ever do any design without it. <laughs> you need to be doing it directly with, like in our system, we, we call them sponsor users. So rather than doing big surveys and all this kind of stuff, you're going to spend probably three to four hours a week co-creating basically with our, uh, with our users and very carefully selecting who they are. Uh, you know, it's not just any four or five, it's, it's they're representative of their, of, of, of their market. Um, but then doing everything together uh, from the earliest ideational stages and, and the like as well. And, and also getting, we, we, one other practice we've, we've done is, is to bring in people who love the competitor product, right? Uh, people that already are, don't hate, uh, you know, hate our stuff, <laughs> you know, well, satisfy them with this overall solution, then you're going to be, uh, even more successful. So I'm a, I, I don't think you can do design without including, you know, users. So one thing that we say is that, well, a friend of mine, uh, Eric Van Hippel, who's a professor at the MIT Business School, has said that for product design, the best way to get ideas is to go out and, and, and visit your customers and find out what they're doing with the product that you're making today. And you will discover that a lot of them say, oh, I love your product, but I, it doesn't do what I need. So I changed it, or I did this, or I added this to it. And they are very creative and they give you ideas. And he calls it lead user innovation. Well, we're starting to use that same method in looking at societal problems. When we look at some of the problems in, in San Diego among the, uh, the poor people, um, they have lots of problems, but you know what? There are very many creative people in the world. That what, what my friends and I say is there are what, 7 billion people in the world? There aren't enough designers to go around, but we don't need them because there are many creative people who already have approached things and done things that are wonderful. Now, <clears throat> what they do usually, they understand the problem. You don't need to send anthropologists to study them because they live there. They know what the problems are. They know what the resources are. They know what their abilities are. And so they come up with good ideas, but they may not have the right resources to solve these larger system problems. So they tend to solve the symptoms. 
And uh, what designers can do is be facilitators and guides and helpers and help bring the resources in. So one of the groups I spent time with in um, Hyderabad, I'm sorry, uh, Bangalore, <laughs> um, Bangaluru, is um, the, the group that's called the Ugly Indians. Do any of you know about the Ugly Indians? They're the ones who say people are throwing the trash in the streets and they're, they're, they're disgracing or they, the, the men urinate on the walls in public and, uh, and spit and do all sorts of horrible things. So they decided that they would solve the problem because nobody else was. And one of the problems is that, well, where do they throw their trash? There isn't any other obvious place. But second, once somebody throws trash, it's a signal to other people that they can put their trash there. And so what they did was they simply enlist people from the community to say, hey, come and join us just for three hours on one day. And what we're going to do is we're going to paint the walls and we're going to plant plants on the grass on the, you know, behind the sidewalk and make it neat. And in three hours, we'll only do a small distance, you know, maybe 50 meters or something. But that's okay, because another Sunday, we'll come in and do another three hours and pretty soon we'll do a long section. And when you make something look attractive and you paint it very nice, well, People don't throw their garbage and men don't urinate there and so on. And um, the problem is though, this has been very effective and they do this all the time and they don't get permission. They refuse to get permission. Uh, and when, some, when the journalists discover them and said, who gave you permission? They name the politician who's in charge of the area, which is good because, because it's a good thing that the newspaper is writing about the good works. And so the politician, oh yes, oh, of course I gave permission. But here's a problem. They put up urinals for men. So you, men can, can go into a somewhat private place and, uh, and urine. But um, so I asked them, what about women? Oh, women aren't a problem because women don't urinate in the street. So I then went to the women and I asked them about this. And they said, yes, we don't, we're not allowed to. So what we have to do is we're very careful not to drink any liquids before we go out. Or either that or we have to learn to, to stand the pain and hold it in and not do it. So here's a problem that I think that this group is wonderful. It's a community group, it's doing a lot of good, but they aren't tackling the whole problem and they're only tackling the visible parts. So what a designer can come in and work with them and say, well, why don't we find a solution? Or let's go and talk to the women who you aren't addressing and let's see what solution we can devise for them. So that's how we would work with the community. We work as partners. I, I would add one other uh, business example, Don, to that, that uh, I was working with a bank, you know, really traditional, you know, business, right? And they were wanting to, improve the way that, or, or the, the satisfaction that customers had in calling their call centers, right? And it's a big problem for many, many companies. And so everybody thought there was gonna be some technical solution that needed to come in, you know, but when we really worked directly with the people that worked in the call centers, we got this really, really in, uh, interesting insight in that they, what they really wanted was be able to take breaks and lunches with their friends. And they weren't able to, right? They were just sitting there in the little cubicle doing all their calls and stuff like that because the whole schedule was, was you know, arranged to optimize things for the company, right? And when the senior executives heard that that's all they needed to do was just change, change the way they schedule their, their breaks and, and, and lunches, they thought, well, that's easy to, and very cheap uh, to, to implement. They implemented it. And the results were that the <laughs> clients calling into those call centers were even, you know, happier, obviously, now without expending anything other than the time to understand and empathize with who it is that's part of that system. That's another business example. So, you know, picking up from what uh, Don and you said, talking about simplicity, I have another question from a, a, a professor of ours, Professor Shamit Srivastav. He's possibly going to be one of the youngest design PhDs um, as, as well. Uh, so he talks about design is also about making things simple. 
uh, but with new technologies, services, business models, and other such interdisciplinary blend of domains, how do we retain this simplicity? Because simplicity is in the head. It's not in the product. Um, and I will tell you about my kitchen. My kitchen is very simple. I can always find what I need. I can cook. Uh, my wife can cook. We can cook together without getting in each other's way. We know where everything is. It's very simple. If, if a friend, well, say my, my daughter is visiting, forget about COVID, so we can't do that today. But when my daughter used to visit and she said, oh, I want to cook something for you. She found the, the kitchen so complicated, she couldn't use it. She couldn't find anything. Everything was in a different place or she didn't have the things she needed. And so the point being is that what is simple for one person is maybe complex for another. If you understand that it is simple. And so the, the secret to making things that are, that are simple is to make them understandable. And I understand my kitchen and my wife understands our kitchen because every single thing we decided where to put it. So we have knives, we have a knife here and a different knife there and a different knife over here. We don't put all the knives in one place, probably none of you do. We put them where we need them. And uh, so we understand this pattern, but another person doesn't. So I, I actually wrote a book about this. I wrote a book called living with complexity. And I said, everybody wants something to be simple. So you make something that's really simple. I'm gonna make, somebody once said, I have a device that only has three buttons. Why can't everything else have three buttons? And I say, well, that only allows you to do three things. And if you wanna do more than those things, oh yes, you could push this button and that button at the same time, or you could push this button twice or you could hold this button down for a long time. Well, that's what Apple has done with the iPhone. And let me tell you, it is getting worse and worse. Who can remember? Do I swipe, swipe left or right or up or down? Or do I start from halfway down and pull down a little bit and then hold my finger still? It's crazy, but it looks simple, doesn't it? It looks simple and easy, but it isn't. So simplicity is in the head. And the way you make something simple is you make people understand things. You give them a simple model that they can learn. And also you give them, you, as a designer, I provide hints. Apple refuses to use words. They hate words because words are ugly. Put some words in. Telling people what something does really helps. Don, I have uh, uh, a question coming back. Uh, can I? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's nice to meet Karal and Don again. Uh, indeed, pleasure to interact. Uh, I have a question coming back to the future of design education. We discussed about um, faculty, but here I want to bring the point about the parents. You see, in typical situation, the mindset of parents is that their child has to perform well, get better rank, uh, not allowing them to fail. Actually, this is what the mindset is, that the, my child has to secure the best grade in this uh, grading system is putting such a pressure where it is contradicting with design education, where you're allowing to experiment, you're allowing to fail and uh, deal with ambiguity. And sometimes because of this mindset of parents, many times the talented young children who can uh, contribute a lot, not able to get into the stream of design. So uh, in your view, we are working in future of design education. How are we deal with this parents mindset for encouraging the children to, to, uh, to attempt to fail and then move forward. Like yeah, I, would, I would say actually that, as we were saying earlier, uh, uh, pardon me, that we needed to start earlier, right? And, and I think it, it also includes even, even parents. Uh, I'm, I'm dealing with this right now and uh, we're trying to uh, hire a lot of um, underrepresented minorities uh, to make, make our company more diverse. And a lot of the perception, a lot of the difficulty is actually the parents' view of what the uh, what design is all about. There's a view that it's 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 art, and how could you possibly get a job doing that? And and then you get into the things like you're describing of actually wanting to uh, 
be be more resilient in terms of of, of experimenting and 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 having you know experiencing problems as well. I, I really think that it just needs to start earlier, and I think it needs to um, be imbued in 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 the things that we've already talked about that 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 you have this experience as a young person and uh, the the uh, parents get to see the the work that that's being done they can start to uh, appreciate uh, this as, as well um and 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 as more and more people get this point of view in they're they're going to be parents themselves uh, doing this you know work uh, as well but i would make one, one other quickie comment about about failure uh I, I work with a lot of startups and, and startups are, are fond of saying, you know, uh, uh, you know, break things and move fast and make a lot of errors, errors and stuff and, and, and get to failure. And I would say, you don't have to, though, you should actually understand what you're doing first. <laughs> so you should probably work with some people that are the users uh, are going to be the eventual users of what it is that you're, you're, you're building, really understand the problem, really deeply work directly with them in coming up with a, a design of whatever your idea is. It, it is. And you won't be 90% of you won't be failing, right? You're going to increase your likelihood of success. You're still going to be running into some, you know, problems down the road that you need to be resilient and learn from, you know, it'll be smaller failures because it won't simply be nobody in the world wants to use the thing that you just created because you never asked anybody whether anybody else other than you had that problem, right? So I think there is a, 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 a mindset of, understanding deeply first what it is that you're going to be uh, building and then being resilient to um, learning from any failures that you have as well. And everybody needs to have that point of view. Does that make sense? My answer is that this is actually a very complex system problem because the parents are correct that the way that society is organized today is that grades are very important and that getting a degree is very important. And uh, in the United States, uh, the, the university you go to is very important. It's interesting, that isn't necessary. In Germany, the, the university isn't so important because all the universities are thought to be roughly equal. Uh, but, some, but in the United States, oh, you go to MIT, or in India, you go to IIT, uh, it's considered superior, but why? So one problem is the way the world runs. Another problem is the way that we teach in education. So we teach subjects that are not, that are irrelevant. Let me example, let me talk about algebra, how to solve a quadratic equation. We spend a lot of time teaching people how to solve quadratic equations and it's hard for people to learn and they make mistakes while doing it because you have to do all sorts of calculations along the way you make errors. Well, you know, I was trained as an engineer. I had six years of engineering school, uh, uh, two degrees in engineering. And I learned, I had six years of engineering mathematics. Uh, so I, of course I knew algebra and geometry. And of course I knew calculus. And of course I knew advanced calculus. And do you know how many times when I was an engineer, I used this mathematics? Almost never. You may know how many times I solve a quadratic equation? I don't need to. I have a calculator that will solve the quadratic equation for me. Why am I spending time doing things? I had to learn about logarithms because we had to use logarithms back when I was a child or a, a student. Uh, we don't do that anymore because we don't need logarithms. We have calculators. We teach people things that are simply because we teach them because we've always been teaching them. Next, the grading system is horrible, just absolutely horrible. In fact, most teachers hate exams and hate to give grades. Uh, and it's, we know that the grades don't mean anything. The grades tell you how well you can take an exam. On top of that, a grade in a course so you don't, let's take a grade system, which is on percentage, 100. If someone gets 100%, does that mean they know everything? No. If they get 90%, well, what does that mean? They mean everything they know only 90% of the way or 10% or of the things they don't know at all. It's meaningless. So here's what I propose. And it's not my idea. This is an idea that's around. It's called mastery learning. And I taught a course once like this. 
What we did in the course, I had written a textbook called Human Information Processing, a basic textbook in psychology. What we did, my students and my, um, my assistants and I, which were my graduate students and I, we divided it up into small units. And each unit was, you could learn a unit in a few hours or some of them took maybe a week, but none of them were longer than a week and most of them were just a day or two. And then each unit had a simple examination and students would study the unit and then they would come and take the exam. And if they passed the exam, we said, okay, pass. If they didn't pass the exam, we say, well, sorry, uh, go back and study some more and then come back and take the exam again. And so at the end of the course, here's what happened. Each, each of the modules, uh, you, the students had a list of modules they had passed. We did not record the ones they had not passed. We didn't care. We only cared about what have you learned. And at the end, what I would prefer to do is not give them a grade at all. Simply say, okay, here's what the student knows. So here are the 30 things the student knows. And I guarantee the student knows because the student has passed an examination on it. And uh, when you want to get a job, that's what an employer should look at, not about your grades, but what did you learn? What do you know? And I'll see whether that meets what I need from students. And I was, un I was forced to get grades. So we simply said, okay, if you get 20 modules, you get an A. And if you only pass 18 modules or 16 or whatever it was, you get a B. And so the number of modules you pass determined your grade. But that's wrong because we really just want to know what the content was. Now, a number of people have been, been arguing for this. Uh, mastery learning. We do it in small units and we simply say, yes, you've mastered it. I don't have to give a grade. You've done it. You've done, you, we know that you know it. To change the educational system is going to be difficult. But I think personally that's what's needed. Because today, this whole system is based around grades and based around not failing and based around the wrong things. And so when the parents complain, uh, the parents are correct. So the problem is not the parents, the problem is the system. Thank you, that, that, that is me. Um, so that, do we have any more questions? Or, or can I, I, can I uh, just building on what uh, Carl and, and, and Don said and, uh, I'm also going to welcome Surya because I saw him in, in, in the panel and I said he should join us because I remember when he visited us uh, way back in uh, probably 2016 uh, and he did a fantastic talk on uh, connective systems. Um, and uh, at that point in time, he was just going to talk about how Microsoft is using the mobile uh, to drive change. And before the lecture started, I know we had our... Uh, previous head of administration, not Mina, say, okay, students, now switch off your mobile phones and put them in your pocket, right? And that was uh, the end of the lecture at that point in time. But uh, Surya, welcome, uh, and thank you for being with us. Um, and uh, so the question that I have uh, is, uh, is, is trending, and this is, I can, I can make this out, this is probably from our fourth year students. Um, it's what are the skills that future designers will need to have um, and how can we start working towards building those to succeed in today's design industry? Are you asking us or are you asking Surya? I, I, Don, I'm going to ask to always start with you and then follow, follow with the rest. So I'm going to ask you to lead with that one. Well, I'm going to give you a simple answer. We don't know. That's why we are engaged in this very big project with people from around the world. So to, to, to try to answer that. And we think it is wrong for Carl and me and actually our steering committee of 16 very senior distinguished people uh, to give the answer. We want the answers to come from the people around the world, from India, from South Africa, from Latin America uh, to give us the answers. We want people from industry and people from academics and so we're very careful that we have both academics and industry people on our committees. And we want, we even have undergraduates who want to help and that will be good. 
I'd like to hear the, the opinions of undergraduates and graduate students and young professors and young people in industry who, who are now saying, oh, what I learned in school is not what, what I need. And so I don't want to answer that question. I want these people to answer the question. So here, I promise, ask me in three years to come back and then ask me the question. We'll hold you to that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think, I'll take a stab at uh, what I think, you know, maybe it's a little bit uh, brash. Um, but I think um, there is, we've been saying for a bit now that, you know, design's been trying to get a seat at the table, design's been trying to get a seat at the table. All right, we got a seat at the table. We have that seat. So in organizational context, we were really struggling with this seat at the table, what to do with it. And there are just issues around leadership skills. So we've been asked to orchestrate, right? All right, you know, if you say this design thing is so cool and it can have uh, uh, impact uh, in terms of organizational transformation, social transformation, so go ahead and lead. And that's where I find a lot of the challenges in, that are happening today because uh, if truly this discipline has moved towards some kind of centralized or this way of thinking, not as not being turfish about people, but this way of thinking about design. If it seems to have value just because we are in VUCA worlds, things are complex, we need to be systemic, we need to be future oriented, we need to embrace constraints, all those things that we know. But the people who have a high level of skill can lead others don't seem trained enough or have confidence enough to confidence enough to influence and lead that. So I think leadership is something that pops up. I have a simple I, answer. I have a, go ahead. Tom. I'm going to. You, you'll like my answer, Carl. We have a, <laughs> we have a real expert here, because Carl's job is exactly that of training the designers, two thousand five hundred of them at IBM, to become leaders. So now I turn it over to Carl. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. Yes. Yeah, I think it's. I, I think you've nailed it. I, I think that having t t several views of this. One. One is just the transformation of the influence and impact of design is is one one thing we need to recognize. And and the story that I would tell really quickly is, you know, some 12, 15 years ago, I had this really amazing designer that went off and drew a design on a, on a whiteboard and the development team was sitting there watching it and said, no, oh, not bad and all that. And, and the next week he came in and he changed the entire design and the whole development team, you know, just revolted and said, what? We, we just implemented everything you said last week. And he said, he just had never experienced that before. It was always like, here's the design and some of it'll, you know, find its way into the application and the like, right? But I think we're now at this point where design is so powerful uh, and has so much influence, right? That if we don't recognize that with that power comes responsibility and knowing what to do with that responsibility, I think we are really going to miss the mark. I mean, you know, some will say that we've, you know, seriously impacted, you know, uh, democracies with, with design that's, that's been inappropriately focused only on revenue generation for, for, you know, getting eyeballs, you know, on applications or, uh, and, and the like. Um, the whole focus on, you know, impacting the environment with a lot of the things that we've done with, with some of our in industrial design and the like. So I think there's a, and a large part of what Don and I are doing with this initiative is to take that sort of um, opening the aperture on what is relevant uh, to design. So part of that is for every designer that we don't have a, an instance of a, a craft designer that can just do what their company tells them to do, and but know that also has a broader perspective. But then, as Don is, uh, 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 talks about often, uh, we need to have the leadership to be able to to give them the you know I hate military analogies, but uh, air cover to to actually do the right thing for the user. Right, that might be an ethical issue. Might it might be just a. Uh, not wanting to make something so addictive that somebody will never, there was a, I did a, a thing with some students yesterday, uh, a playback of a, of a, uh, a system they came up with an app that was going to help people, especially during uh, COVID, uh, be able to work globally more effectively and like anyway it doesn't matter what the uh, the, uh, the app was but I was saying there's so much cognitive load and, and if you made this app really really popular 
then students aren't going to be actually listening to and learning what they're supposed to be learning. The app will actually be, you know, taking way much too much of their time and the like and their interaction with students and stuff. But stepping back again from seeing that that perspective. But I think from a design leadership point of view, I, I totally agree with you. I think that we need to be teaching that. I think we, uh, Don and I have made the observation that many of the leaders of, of design in many companies weren't uh, designers to begin with, you know, and that, and because they have a broader perspective, you know, on, on the, on, on this whole area, but I'm actually going through and uh, now introducing more multidisciplinary, even to, uh, to uh, topics to our de designers, our design executives, uh, like around the company, we have about uh, 150 of them globally, um, to really start to go down this path of actually building up that knowledge. I, I did a bunch of one-on-one um, -on -one interviews, so half an hour, half hour interviews with, with a bunch of them. And they were like, you know, great, I'm now at this level. They had, they were, you know, really great designers and they now are not bad leaders either, but they now are sort of asking me, okay, well, you know, I want to close the gap on how do I actually do this? I feel like I'm having to make it up myself, right? Uh, because they were never sort of taught it. Um, and, and not even so much taught it. It's even, they weren't given the opportunity to learn it because they, as designers, they just learned craft <laughs> uh, design and, and the like. So I think there really is a huge opportunity to, to do that uh, as part of our overall future direction. So I, I couldn't agree more. I think the problem is in the, the way that we teach designers so there are two problems. In many design schools, <clears throat> take you know National Institute of Design. What do you study besides design? You go in and you learn design. You learn the skills of craft, you learn how to draw, you learn about materials, you learn about construction and ways, and you do lots of things. But as we are explaining, design cannot stand by itself. Design is not the most important thing in the world. Design is a tool that enables us to create other things that make life more enjoyable and superior and better. But that means that we must understand the impact on other people, on society. That's why we have to understand uh, the history of our country, the history of the world. We have to understand economics. We have to understand the way that people live. We have to understand the variety of cultures and the variety of ways that different people and different groups of people think. Uh, and we don't teach that in design school. Um, the other thing is that we teach people to do their work by themselves. Everybody has to do their own project and they're graded on how well they do their project. But when you get into the world, Almost nobody works by themselves. We work in big groups, large groups. And on top of that, they are groups of people from different disciplines and different backgrounds. And so we don't train people to work as a team and learning to be a team member is very important. And if you, start, if you teach people how to work in a team, what we like to do is we take the beginning students and they are members of the team. And then the second year students are maybe managers. And the third and fourth year students are the leaders of the team. So we are automatically also teaching leadership and how to be a manager. And we, we do that without saying, we don't tell them we're gonna teach you how to be a manager. We simply cause it to happen. In fact, the best way, the worst way to teach is to tell people, here's what you're going to learn. The best way to teach is to give them something they really enjoy doing. This is a wonderful project, it's exciting. And, and when they're all finished, it turns out we, don't, we didn't even care about the project. What they learned was they learned how to work in a team, they learned how to manage, they learned how to be a leader, they learned about the role of, of economics, we learned about the trade-offs you must make because, oh, we only had six months to do it and so we had to, we had to skip some of the steps we wanted to do or maybe this part was too expensive, so we had to change it. You learn those things. But it's up to the educators, which I assume is all 20 people that I see on the screen in front of me, and maybe the 246 people that are watching, that um, that's what we must be teaching people, and that's what those of you who are students need to be learning. John, love, uh, love that model where you're, uh, you know, you're talking about those classes and how you tr uh, 
you actually have people create different outcomes because it's these outcomes during education, there's certain outcomes we're helping people create and then we celebrate them for those outcomes. There were outcomes we created, which is showcase your brilliance, the novelty, the amazingly different point of view. When you, when you go off, do these brilliant things as a designer, come with this perfectly formed gift, it's a different outcome than the one you talk about is how do you negotiate? How do you lead? How do you influence? How do you carry something through the entire cycle? How do you give up on your idea and support somebody else's, right? And all of those kinds of things. So, you know, I know the design education I went through was all about my amazing brilliance from my brain that I would always create these perfectly formed visions right? Rather than how it actually moves to a system as a group of people. So I think that's, that's such an important insight. Let me give you another insight I learned from Surya. Mm -hmm. um, that there is some, the, there is an activity called a hackathon that's become very popular all over the world. And we bring people together to hack. Um, hack, hack being to create without necessarily any real plan. I'm a member of the Hacker Society in the United States, which is actually a very prestigious group. Uh, it's a people who are proud of their skills to, to hook up, to make something quickly out of you know, weird materials. Um, but the hackers group bothers me because people love the hackathon. They get together and they don't sleep for three or four days and they create they, uh, an answer to a problem. And it's all done about by mostly by programmers and there's no understanding of the people who might use it. There's no testing about whether it makes sense or not. So I was really bothered by this and I discovered Surya and Surya has developed something called design swarms. And we now call them, uh, we've been calling them designathons. And what we say is we don't allow you to do a hackathon because we don't, you don't, we first make sure you understand what the problem is about. And, and at the end, you make sure that whatever it is you've constructed actually works. And we do this so quickly. We're out doing hackathons in, in a few weeks, not, not a few days. We take a few weeks and we even have one that is last four months uh, with students. And I learned that from Surya because I watched Surya and Surya and I talked and he showed me the methods he's using. We borrowed a lot of his methods. And so what, the, what we're beginning to do with that is exactly what I'm saying. We make people focus on the needs of the people they're designing for and make them work with them. And they have to, because we have the programmers and because we have the builders and the, the engineers and because we bring in the designers they are learning to work in a team. And because it's called, it's a contest, they actually enjoy it. So that's the kind of education. Well, I want an education where people enjoy it. I, would, I was gonna give this a similar example actually of things that we need to do often that aren't necessarily core to the curriculum in addition. And a number of uh, the people I see on here are, are, were also part of an initiative we, we ran at the beginning of the COVID uh, uh, experience. Uh, we did a COVID-19 design challenge globally with the World Design Organization, uh, with Design for America, and then with IBM. And we had seven you know challenge statements and people from all backgrounds all around the world, you know, 17 uh, time zones, all worked on solving some fundamental problems. And to, to Don's point, we also really wanted to make sure, unlike the hackathons where you just start to code and you don't know what the, the problem is, we spent a lot of time trying to really understand, you know, what what what, what is going on. There was a there was a, a, a team that that looked at challenges of um, of women in small uh, uh, villages in in India uh, uh, during during uh, COVID with with, with uh, um, you know particular uh, uh, violent situations at home and the like. They came up with a real a brilliant solution, you know, to doing that problem by deeply understanding what the problem was first and then what what a solution could be. So I think some of the time we, we don't need to do everything in the curriculum. <laughs> uh, we can actually just encourage, like the Design for America organization, for example, in, in, uh, in the US has some, um, uh, I think 42 campuses where it's, it's voluntary efforts with students getting together from different disciplines 
solving local problems typically to wherever that their school is. Uh, I think those are the kinds of things we, we should be thinking about as well, in addition to the core curriculum as well. John, a shout out, and I've just put a link in the chat, which was that your powerful keynote last February at Interaction 19, where you laid out um, these ideas uh, on uh, 21st century design. And uh, I think some of these uh, amazing experiments that you're running with designathons and the underlying thinking. So just wanted to uh, point to folks that, uh, you know, what Don mentioned here, here is sort of the philosophical underpinnings of uh, that in that talk. So uh, amazing talk. You know, I have another, con sorry, Ananda, go ahead. And then I have one controversial question, which keeps- No, no, please ask the controversial <laughs> question. I can ask another one after that. The after you. Is yes. the advent of artificial intelligence, um, will the designer be redundant? No. The designer will be more important than ever. That, but it will change the way that designers work. And um, here, here's, here's the example I, I like to give. It's an example from uh, the company Autodesk, which uh, makes a lot of the tools that designers use. And they have an artificial intelligence tool that actually does the design for you. Uh, what you do is you tell it the constraints and the problem and the goal, and it goes and gives you, the, gives you solutions. And they told me this story that they were testing it. And they, they, they asked a, a, a great designer to please use the tool. And the, the designer was insulted and said, no, I refuse to use it. I don't need anything like that. I'm really good myself, et cetera. They said, please, you know, you work with us, you help us. So do us a favor. We want you to use this for a month. It has to take a whole month. And uh, then at the end, tell us your opinion and give us suggestions. And he started off by saying he hated it. And after the first week, he hated it. And at the end of the month, he said, please don't take it away. I don't ever want to be without it. So let me explain what you do, and I'll give you an example that's a real example. The, uh, the company Airbus that makes, you know, there are two major companies in the world that make uh, airplanes for, air, for passengers, and that's Boeing in the United States and Airbus in Europe. So Airbus wanted to have a, a separator between first class and tourist section of the airplane. And the separator, it's a fairly simple thing to do, and they, they've been building it for a long time, but they said it weighs too much. They wanted to reduce the weight because weight is very important. So what they did is they simply said, they used, they used the program to say, we want to build a divider and it has to be roughly, it has to be this wide and it has to be this high. And we want it to be as strong as possible and as light as possible, and it has to be attractive. And it has to be strong because people put their feet on it, people bump against it, they, they knock it with their suitcases, uh, and, um, and that's it. And the program, what it does is it produces thousands of results. Now, the point is, so where is the designer's role? Ah, why the designer liked it is because for the first time you say, I don't have to spend hours and hours drawing the tiny little details. What I can do is use my head as a designer and I try to specify what are the requirements? What are the constraints? And then when you start, when the program gives me examples, I say, that's no good, do, don't do any more like that. Or, oh, that, there's something interesting there, do more like that. And the program is learning. So every time you say no, it, it changes itself. So it doesn't do more like that. And every time you say it's a good direction, then it does it. And you keep going until you find some solution. Or if after a while you say, none of this is satisfactory, well, then you step back and you'll be a designer again. And you say, hmm, how can I change the description of the problem that might give me results that are better? And in the end, uh, the, the solution that the computer and the designer together came up with is what is actually being used today in today's airplanes. And let me also point out that because of 3D printing, you can now make materials 
that could never be made before because you can leave holes inside of it. Holes that just simply add weight, but don't add to the strength. And you can make designs that could never be, have been manufactured before. And so you, the, a person is not capable of doing that computation, but the machine is. But the person, the designer is capable of making the, the judgment, the aesthetic judgment, does this fit the, the, the beauty? Does it fit the, the rest of the airplane design? Uh, does this fit the economic requirements? Does this meet, is it easy for, to install this in the airplane? Is it easy to fix it or replace it if, it if it breaks or is damaged? And so a designer for the first time can, is free of all the mechanical stuff you have to do. And by the way, if you take a look at um, traditional engineering, for doing calculations. It used to be you spent most of your time doing arithmetic and doing calculations. And today you don't do that. Today you spend all of your time being an engineer. You let the computer work out whether it's strong enough or whether uh, it's, et cetera. So yeah, AI is gonna make designers better. I would add one but other thought and that is that not just looking at the, uh, what is, AI going to do in terms of the actual making the role of the designer different. I think I wanted to bring back the bigger opening the aperture aspect of design that we we've been talking about as well. And that is that when you think about if the designer only worried about the UI of the tool that you're building that has AI and machine learning in it, um, that's not sufficient. You got to open the aperture and see the bigger picture view of the entire experience. So for example, things like having a corpus of data that is biased, right? Um, right now we've got all kinds of decisions being made in the systems that we're designing that is, is, is hidden, right? These are decisions that are being made on the basis of data that a lot of time is, is, uh, is, is biased. So one of the things we've been doing is building tools for that, but it's the designer that has to step back and say, well, wait a minute, we just did a bunch of testing with this and the, you know, these disadvantaged groups or, 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 or people with different co colored skin, for example, just are not being uh, recognized appropriately in this system. I think it's the designer that has to have that broader perspective to say, okay, now we've got to go and fix our, our database. You know, when did you ever think of designers having to have responsibility for that? Well, I think that is the role of the designer because you ultimately have the, I think even moral responsibility for the system that you're actually building, not just the UI that the, that the, that the user is gonna actually interact with. We call it- Charles. We call it people-centered design or human-centered design because we focus upon the people. And by the way, the other disciplines do not. The engineering disciplines and the other disciplines, economics and uh, et cetera, they focus on um, some kind of performance measure. And the performance measure is always all based on money or time. And we say, no, we want our performance measure to be based on what it means for the people. And that's where designers are also quite unique and the role that we can play in, in, a, in a project. Yeah, uh, I mean, Carol, I, fit to that. Uh, I had one last question. Okay. If, if I may. Uh, do, do, you, do, you, do you imagine a, a, an institution which is transdisciplinary, transcontinental, uh, which could have students across the world, uh, which we would call the missing semester of CAP? Yeah, Would fascinating question. Fascinating yeah. question. I think it's, I think you're you're bang on. I think I've been talking to the CEOs of some of the, um, the what are called boot camp uh, uh, programs. You know, short uh, introductions to UX design, for example, and they're experiencing this absolute, you know ballooning of opportunity during COVID because everybody now can uh, get on uh, online uh, for this. And I, I think that there's a, I always like to say that I don't want the world to go back to normal. Right, because I, I think we can actually make a better world, and we can design a better one. We can design better schools. We can uh, design a better uh, student experience with things like what you're suggesting. That why not? I mean, the only real constraint, which we're also probably hitting here today, is the is time zones. <laughs> we haven't solved that one yet. Um, designers have to come up with a solution to that one. But the uh, but no, I, I really I totally agree with you. I think there's huge value, and I see the opportunity for people to get to, together uh, to uh, build 
solutions that make sense across the world. I think Don mentioned that the US uh, and, and some other countries are have sort of a two-tiered approach to education with sort of the elite schools and, and, uh, and the like and then the others. Um, I happen to sit in a country in Canada that doesn't quite have that. And there's a, uh, I've worked with like the, the, um, the deans of a number of schools here um, and said, what could we collectively do <clears throat> to improve our society by improving, you know, education? And they first started saying, yeah, but we're all competitors, Carl. I said, don't, you don't have to be competitors. Let's actually see the end result that we're going for is actually just improvement in, in, in education for, for our students. So I, I truly have that same, you know, uh, objective, I think, that you do. Sorry, I think Adam wanted to ask a question. Adam, are you there? No, it wasn't, it wasn't a question. It was building on what Carl was talking about. Uh, John Maida, uh, uh, he's uh, been talking a lot about a new discipline called computational design, which essentially addresses many of the things that Carl was talking about, which works with data scientists and analytics and actually structures data in ways to integrate into systems to avoid some of the things that Carl was talking about and try to get to better outcomes because data is driving these systems and most of these decisions on how, structure, how the data is structured, the metadata is structured is done by data scientists and engineers. And he asked, and this is where we could bring human-centered thinking into the data itself. And to that, the, so your question was about, what do you think about AI in uh, design? I think the question is, can we possibly do design without the help of AI going forward. Think about it. in the last 48 hours, as much data got created as was created from the beginning of when we started creating knowledge till uh, the 48 hours before. So mm -hmm. we are creating, data is being created at this enormous rate, right? And if it turned out that we were designing for hundreds or thousands or a million people, the me most of the things we design or many of the things we design are designed for a billion people, right? Very often that's the case, that's the case. So if you got these two huge forces that you've got, you live in a data soaked world and you're designing for such large numbers, can, how do you actually go through that business of what designers do alternative divergence and convergence without the help of these AI systems, right? To be able to create alternatives very quickly and then help you understand implications very quickly. And, and, I, and I also, I study, right? Yeah. yeah. But, but I also, think, Adam, why don't you finish your thought? Yeah, no, I, I, I just think also we need this. We need this. I, I wish we would stop using the term AI and use the term learning systems because I, I really think that that's the value of AI is to create learning systems. Which, which animate a lot of what Don talked about and others have talked about. I think it's the learning that's important for continuous improvement rather than treating it as AI, which has a lot of baggage. Well, first of all, AI means many things and you're absolutely right. The part we're mostly talking about is called machine learning. It's the learning system. But let me, let me take an issue, sorry, I disagree a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think we should stop making the same product for a million people. Yeah. And what, what's coming now, and in part because of our improved technology, new methods of manufacture, so that uh, <clears throat> with additive manufacturing and other ways, we for the first time can make millions of products, each one of which is different and tailored to particular needs. So that uh, why should they, the thing that we make for the United States also be what we sell in India? And India itself is a huge country with many, many different states that have different requirements and different kinds of needs. And so why the same product in each of those states? And I, it's not here yet, but I see that uh, in maybe another 10 years, we'll be able to do that. We don't need these, what we see, the way we do many, many products, we make very expensive machines that make the same, stamp out identical thing. When you make an automobile, you have these, you have machines. One of the problems if you're an automobile designer is, is that you, you want to bring out a new car and it takes four or five years to design. But like in the first month, the engineers say, um, okay, tell us what the fender looks like because we have to order the machine today. It will take three years to build the machine. So you have to start ordering the parts before you're ready. 
Well, that will change, but with new manufacturing methods. And I'm really looking forward to that day. Absolutely. I wanted to just revisit the question that you all asked uh, with, you know, what do students need to know? And we were, Don was saying, we don't know yet. We'll know in three years. But there's one thing that we do know from everything that you all have talked about and this notion of lifelong, lifelong learning <laughs> and that things are changing so much that you can't just go to, you know, school for four years and then you know what you need to know. Uh, no, you, 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 and, and I think we need to even uh, sort of revisit that whole model. And I, 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 we do that, you know, at IBM, this whole notion of what kind of education you need to uh, uh, do each year. There's a requirement actually that we, we have for the number of hours of education and like that people need to do. But even from our, our designer's point of view to, to sort of get into a totally different mindset each time to learn about the new technologies, to learn the new challenges that those technologies bring in and the like, there's, there's probably no other, well, many other disciplines, engineering is probably the same, same thing, but I think designers in large part need to just be you know, active learners and be passionate about learning and changing and throwing away things that they done before that aren't appropriate anymore for today's sort of world. I think that's true of every profession, by the way, that we, and that's where mastery learning comes in because uh, to keep me up to date, I don't have to take a whole years of courses. I, I need to take, you know, maybe seven, eight, 10 modules. Thank you, thank, thank, thank you, thank you so much. I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions. I think we will try and sort of farm all those questions and maybe share it with you and you can you can respond to them at pleasure. Yeah, I'm fine. I now invite Siddharth to um, sort of, um, um, introduce everybody else. So that would you would you would you like to thank and yes, thank you, Anando. Um, um, you know, Don and Dal, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out and having this most valuable session. Um, you know, Surya, Adam, and Sonam, I was following your work throughout the afternoon, and again, I think this has been absolutely invaluable for the cross section of attendees that we've had. Uh, right from young students about, uh, we peaked at about 350 young students during during the day. Uh, we've had uh, academia from other institutions and also many of our employers. Um, this conference, I would say, has really cemented some of the forward thinking ideas that you have brought to the table. Um, and I, we've actually got, and I'm going to request the team if they can very quickly present, we've got uh, some of our students who have actually done uh, some summarizing uh, for for each session. So Anando, um, you know, maybe you want to very quickly take them uh, through this because I know they've been very, very excited. Uh, so on yeah. behalf of, uh, I would say the world of design academia, the world of design, thank you all of you for taking out this time. And as Carl said, we're very, very privileged, uh, you know, in terms of the opportunities that the, I know the pandemic has been terrific uh, but the opportunity to have you here today with all of us and talking to people across the globe has been phenomenal. So, Ananda, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, what, what can I say? I think we've had a wonderful, wonderful session, this one, and as well as all the other ones that we've had since, uh, since 4 o'clock. It's been absolutely exciting. We are all going to pull all of this information together and find a way to share it with, with the world and with, uh, with all of you. Um, thank you so much. I would also want to, the entire team to be a part of part of one frame, if 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 we can possibly do that, Imran. Um, um, uh, anyway, so that will happen. Um, the other thing that we want to do is something that we we set out thinking is that you know as 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 an outcome to to this symposium, we could all put uh, some thoughts together and see what we can do in the year ahead, which we can do together. Um, we can call it the start of the missing semester, perhaps, but something that, you know, Adam, uh, Surya, uh, Carol, uh, Dawn, and uh, Gita, and everybody, uh, Swanam and Neelam, all of us have sort of presented some thoughts and ideas of what we could do in the space of learning. Uh, we've, as, as, you can, uh, as you can tell, we've eliminated teaching and education as, as part of the vocabulary for now. And, uh, we, we're sort of moving ahead with the many experiments that we, we've been doing as, as an institution. Uh, this was one of them. And I think this kind of coming together of minds could actually help us propagate all these ideas into uh, a fruition. 
Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for being with us. Um, it was a real pleasure. Thank you.